Minister of Tourism of the Bahamas. He was the president of the Caribbean Tourism Associate Organization. So that should tell you a lot, and he can tell you a lot, and he is going to tell you a lot. That's what he promised me. And that's why I keep a chart. I'd like to introduce you, Mr. Vincent van der, Wal van der Poel Wallace. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, really, congratulations, Commander, for putting this, uh, this session together. Um, there's no better place to have a conference to talk about airlift than right next to an airport. So um, that makes a great deal of sense. But before I get really into the heart of, um, of my presentation, I want to give you some context, because I think that's very important. What a lot of people seem to forget is the Caribbean economically is really the world's most tourism dependent region. And you're going to hear that over and over again, but I think it's very important for us to begin to recognize that. And in some areas, up to 80% of the people who, 80% uh, of the economy of some of our countries, uh, the GDP is derived from tourism. And as you know, most of our uh, countries in this region are in fact islands, so people have arrived by air or by sea. And I think it's been about a century now when most of the people who are economically most important to the tourism economies of the Caribbean arrive by air. So it doesn't take a great leap to understand that people who arrive by air are economically the most important people for the economies of the Caribbean. So when we start talking about air transportation, is not a trivial matter. It is something that is quite substantial and means a great lot to the people and the economy uh, of the region. Now, the other side of it too is, we've always said that um, the most tourism dependent region ought to have the most tourism competent people. And so the next level you get to is the most airline dependent region must have the most airlift competent people. I mean, there's a very simple uh, um, syllogism that says that that makes a great deal of sense, that when we start talking about something about airlift, this is one of the most serious things that we can talk about because it makes such a difference to our economy. And the one thing I want to make sure that we um, understand is anybody who doesn't get the fact that air transportation and air tourism is completely different from tourism that goes to land-based economies you're missing the boat completely. Let me give you something that I'm going to come back to uh, on uh, more and more during the course of my talk, is that when you begin to take a look at the two most important destinations, leading destinations of the United States of America, uh, there are some shocking statistics that many people don't seem to understand. For example, Orlando and Las Vegas, we are the two most important ones. In the case of Orlando, in the case of Orlando, 50% of all the tourism to Orlando is from the state of Florida, one half. 78% of all the tourism to Orlando, the people drive there, they don't fly there. So their understanding and the way they run tourism is completely different. And the shocker about Las Vegas is something is very much the same, is that more than half of the people who go to Las Vegas drive to Las Vegas. And 25% of all the people who go to Las Vegas comes from the state of California. And most of those people drive there. So when we start talking about island tourism and air transportation tourism and air dependent tourism, we are talking about a special form of tourism because even the most successful destinations in the world, France, Orlando, uh, or Las Vegas, they rely very heavily on, heavily on ground transportation as opposed to air transportation. So if you divorce your understanding of tourism from an understanding of air transportation, you're missing uh, this is a poor pun, you're missing the boat big time. So that understanding, I think, is very, very important to anybody who's involved uh, in, in, in tourism, to make sure that we grasp that uh, so that we can understand that when we start talking about uh, air transportation, there's something very special, and the people who understand that will contribute enormously to what is happening in our region uh, because the livelihood of the Caribbean people uh, depend on it so heavily. Now beyond that, I mean, for some very strange reason, it seems to me when we start talking about tourism, also in the region, we are either allergic, impervious, or oblivious to some facts. 
There are some facts that are unassailable that are very important to begin to understand island tourism in all of the things that we, we do. And part of it is uh, there is a significant mismeasure of tourism in our region. Um, there is a tool called a tourism satellite account. Now, what a tourism satellite account is, it is really the financial statements about how tourism works. And if you're talking about tourism in terms of measuring headcount, it's nonsense. And we have known that for a long, long period of time, but we persist in it because that's the easiest way for us to measure tourism. And as was said in the last session, when we asked about some people in tourism to talk about private uh, um, uh, aircraft uh, tourism, it's very important that people understand how nonsensical a headcount is. I mean, a classic example is, if you have somebody who is staying at a high-end property for 10 days, that person in the way we measure tourism is exactly the same as somebody who just arrived on a cruise ship. Uh, even if you want to talk about stopover tourism, it's the same as somebody who stayed for one night in a low-end uh, um, property. The contribution of that person is not the same, and so we've got to begin to move beyond that. And what TSA, the Tourism Satellite Accounts, do is begin to provide a financial basis and a financial understanding of how the tourism sector uh, um, works. And this mismeasure of tourism is something that is extraordinary. Because what has happened is that we find that the tourism that we ordinarily understand and measure is completely undervaluing what tourism is all about. I will bet you, most of the people working in, in the tourism sector in here and who work for governments will find that in almost every single government report, you will find the measure of tourism is two lines. One, departure taxes. Two, hotel guest taxes. If you understand that as tourism, you don't understand tourism. Because I'm telling you, uh, tourism is something, and the best way I can describe it is the iceberg of any economy. The piece you see is insignificant compared to the piece you don't see. When you start measuring tourism in terms of adding the indirect and induced form of tourism, you suddenly talk about something that's substantially much larger and the contribution to the economy is so much greater. Let me give you an example. If you look at tourism only in terms of the um, departure taxes and uh, hotel guest taxes, here's what you are missing. In most economies, the biggest single source of income from tourism uh, is the import duties and fees attached to importing stuff to service visitors that come into the economy. Nobody measures that as part of tourism. That is the single biggest item of all that goes directly into the government treasury. In addition to that, all of the people who are providing those supplies and who are working, those people are also part of the tourism sector because their income comes from the property they're delivering that stuff to who begins to provide them. When they go to the supermarket and the taxes are paid on that, that's part of it too. In addition to that, all of the people that we have working in the tourism sector uh, who are uh, um, known to all of us, whenever they receive their income, that income is coming from some visitor someplace, and when they go into the supermarket, you find that they're also paying taxes. So when you add up all the taxes and the employment that comes from tourism that is indirect and induced, that number is ordinarily much larger than the number that we ordinarily measure. So people who work in government agencies and continue to measure tourism on the basis that is only departure taxes and, and, and guest room taxes, they are mismeasuring tourism and don't understand it as substantially as they can. And part of the reason I'm talking about all of this is because it's very important that we understand tourism in its totality and the importance of air transportation tourism in its totality before we start talking about some of these refined areas that we think are very, very uh, um, important. And so when we begin to look at it on the broader, broader side of tourism, we are talking about something where we begin to optimize the benefits for things like pre-clearance, but we need to do that all uh, um, in advance. And then let me give you an additional illustration. Uh, we do some things that is close, in my opinion, to nothing short of madness. Um, let's take an example. Let's say that we had a magnificent island that was right next, and very close to, the biggest economy on Earth. And this magnificent island is involved in something called tourism because the people who live in this place with the biggest economy on Earth decide this is a wonderful place to measure. So if we had such an island, uh, what would be the first thing somebody would do in order to take advantage of it when they begin to see some interest in this thing called tourism? They would build a bridge between the island 
and the mainland. And they will notice, lo and behold, the tourism business begins to flow substantially. And when somebody asks the person who built the bridge, <clears throat> why, uh, who's gonna pay for that bridge? The answer that we all understand and know is the bridge is gonna be paid for from the increase in the commerce that's gonna be delivered as a result of putting it in place. And that makes a great deal of sense. And I know you can see where I'm heading already. Then when we move it a little bit further away, and let's make the bridge 100 miles from the mainland. Again, if the water is shallow enough, we'll continue with that bridge. And somebody will say, uh, who's gonna pay for the bridge? And somebody will say that 100 mile bridge is gonna be paid for by the increase in commerce that we are gonna get from people who are using that bridge. And lo and behold, it will be proven and people will begin to do it. How do I know that's true? There is this place called Key West in Florida. In order to get to Key West from Miami, you go over 42 bridges. The toll to get across those 42 bridges to get to Key West is $8.99. And that's what it is. And 76% of all the people who go and stay in a hotel in Key West arrive by car. They don't arrive by air. Now let's separate ourselves a little bit more and let's say the water is too deep in order for us to build that bridge and say we have to fly there. Now let's say that the airline is gonna charge me $99 to fly there. The first thing we do is we decide we're gonna make it much more expensive, we add a departure tax. Then we build an airport and we add a passenger facility charge. Then the country they're coming from decides, well wait a minute, since you apply a departure tax, I'm gonna apply one too. So all of the logic that's involved in building bridges, when all an airline is, is an air bridge, we violate every single day and diminish the demand for our tourism economies. It makes no sense whatsoever, but that's what we continue to do. And if you recognize that the value of tourism is underneath the water in terms of this iceberg, you don't do anything to dissuade and discourage the people who are coming into this area. You wanna make the cost of access as low as possible and making sure that you facilitate the frequency of people coming across this air bridge. And it can be proven, and it's something that I think we all need to make sure that we continue to understand. So you go, for example, from the 899 that's being charged across these 42 bridges that get to Key West, to you take, say, a $99 airfare, and you add a $50 departure tax, a $50 uh, passenger facility charge, and then the other country charge, and so suddenly you're at 249. And now what you've done is you've created competition for yourself because now the customer on the other side is beginning to say, where else can I go for $249 instead of coming to the destination who is depending most heavily on tourism? So I hope that what is being said is something that if you uh, think about it, begin to absorb because I would love to see us begin to do some things in our region that begins to make, as far as I'm concerned, a great deal uh, a, a more sense for our um, of tourism e economy. Let me talk a little bit about preclearance. And the reason that I wanted to talk about the preclearance now uh, with that preamble is because I, I want people to understand that we gotta kind of preclear the cobwebs out of our heads in terms of how tourism works and the value of tourism because that's when you begin to get the value of some of these things uh, such as preclearance. I think as was may, may have been said, I haven't read it as yet, but may have been said at the beginning, I'm originally uh, from the Bahamas, and the Bahamas has had um, preclearance since an act of 1974. So I have seen the value and the benefits of low-cost access to tourism and the benefits of preclearance, which are quite uh, substantial. And you're gonna hear somebody later talking a little bit about preclearance, so I won't uh, address it in any kind of deep uh, detail that I'm sure that you'll be able to get uh, from, from the other speaker. Um, there is no question that preclearance is something to our mutual benefit. And I think we need to recognize that. Uh, it isn't something that is a gift to the people who are in this region. It is truly to our mutual benefit, and it makes a great deal of sense from the United States side. Uh, um, if I'm correct, I think they have 15 preclearance facilities now in, in, in six countries um, around the world. Um, and one of the things that we noticed certainly happened in the Bahamas when we introduced preclearance, and you will see it everywhere else, is outbound tourism from the country increases also. 
because the ease of access now into the United States of America is so much easier, and so they benefit from getting a lot more traffic and a lot more business as a direct result of preclearance. I was shocked to find that last year, 2016, 18 million people were preclared in these facilities outside the United States, which is 15% of the total uh, commercial international arrivals coming in to uh, the United States. And of equal importance, it's a significant security advantage because what in so doing, you are pushing the perimeter that the United States is using as its border in effect farther and farther out uh, um, from the shore, and it's a really much more optimized use of border resources. Because in effect, what they're doing now is reducing the congestion at these traditional places in their own country, and so there's is enormous value um, to the United States of America. And you know, the great news was in November of 2016, I mean, St. Martin was identified as one of 11 new potential sites for preclearance. Um, which adds considerable value, will add considerable value, in my opinion, to it. And if you don't think it has great value, go and take a look at when Abu Dhabi was applying for preclearance. There's a number of U.S. airlines that protested because they claimed, since they weren't flying from there, it provided an enormous advantage to the airlines flying from there, so therefore tried to shut it down. They didn't succeed, but um, tried to shut it down from there. The same thing happened with Dublin and Shannon for years, as we all know, um, they benefited from having preclearance in, in Dublin and Shannon, and as soon as they began to hear there were other places in Europe being considered for preclearance, I mean, they began very nervous. They saw it as a definite threat to their business, so much so, in fact, that their value of Aer Lingus diminished as a result of the announcement uh, that there will be other preclearance facilities being examined in, in other places in Europe. So it does make has a, a, a great deal of value. In fact, last year, in the Bahamas, we have preclearance uh, in Nassau and also in Freeport. And many people don't even remember um, there was a time when there was a little airport on Paradise Island that also had US preclearance. And I can tell you from having been working for that company at the time and being involved in getting that facility built and the preclearance installed, I mean, when you are running a business where people know that they can go back and forth with a great deal of ease, we immediately saw a considerable jump in business as a result of having that preclearance facility uh, in place. So it has enormous advantage. From a tourism development point of view, in terms of uh, uh, looking at it from, uh, from this side, from the Caribbean side, uh, one great value is the whole flexibility of um, what it is. I mean, the best example, I was saying to Regina a little bit earlier, the best example that I can think of is in New York City. When you give an airline the option, in effect, of going back to Newark, to JFK, or to uh, LaGuardia, you are now giving kinds of options that make a world of difference. And the other thing which a lot of people don't seem to recognize is that uh, the most powerful part of preclearance is that once that aircraft leaves that pre-cleared area, it's a domestic flight into any place within the United States of America. So as an independent little destination that is looking to optimize its business into the United States and they identify secondary markets that are very important to them, now you can provide non-stop flights in order to get the people uh, into those areas. And then, of course, there are some little things that we don't spend much time thinking about, but it makes a world of difference. For example, as we all know, going into Miami right now, Miami International, and by the way, um, people began to despise uh, the whole idea of flying into Miami, but it's getting easier and easier with use of technology and also an increase of, of, of preclearance. But one of the things that they hate the most is the idea of I fly into Miami, I clear, and then I gotta go get my bags. Then I have to go on to my next flight in order to, it is a nonsense. And that is something that it becomes a really, really big part of the problem. But here is the biggest secret that I think we have found in terms of the value of preclearance uh, from the Bahamas. I see uh, um, Joy Jibilu, the um, uh, uh, director of tourism, is here from the Bahamas also. And I will deny, even though this is, this is um, videotaped, I will deny I ever said what I'm about to say directly to anybody. The biggest advantage, which is something that many people don't seem to recognize, is 
the fastest growing area of tourism right now is impulse travel. People who decide within the week or two weeks and say, I got to get out of here. Where do you think they go to? They go to places that are easy to get into and easy to get out of. When they begin to do that, you begin to see value that is incredible. And here's the other little bit of secret that happens. People who make impulse decisions pay whatever the rate is that you are asking. Um, what we found for a long period of time is those persons who make their decisions at the last minute are the people who provide you with your rev par and average room rate and spending like no other. They stay for a short period of time, but if you get them in very large volumes, the benefit to your tourism economy is enormous. But if they think in their mind that I gotta go through a lot of hassle to get out of here and get back in, you are outside the consideration set. And I think there was a piece of the statistic that I saw like two years or so ago, something on the order of 14% of all the people who took a vacation in the United States uh, in 2015, I think it was, did it on impulse, meaning it within the month of travel. So that piece of it, as opposed to the long planning vacation where many people try to find the best possible rate and all the rest of that stuff, those people are people who are considerably um, uh, uh, valuable and, and quite important. Um, so, in short, I think it's very, very important that we understand the whole tourism economy. Uh, that we begin to show our understanding of your tourism economy in terms of what we do. I think it's very important that we begin to understand that we are uniquely positioned in the case of being islands, that we need to understand that our tourism is completely different. I can talk about that side of it in terms of what the differences are for a long time, but I'll just give you what I just said, what I said earlier, the headlines. It is a completely different business that is very important. And when you begin to have the pre-clearance opportunities added on top of that, you begin to bring value that is so substantial that I think that you find that when you begin to address the underlying impediments of tourism and you also begin to address some of the other concerns that I talked about, that you will find that in terms of growth and development of tourism, you begin to hit what I consider to be the holy grail as far as economic development. Thank you very much for your attention and I'd love to have some questions. Yes, sir. Classified. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the question is, what are the costs of pre-clearance? Um, it, is, it is an expense because the country has to put in place uh, the cost of it. And as I say to a number of people who ask about pre-clearance in the Bahamas, we had the advantage of purpose building the pre-clearance facility since we knew it was happening in advance. Retrofitting it is a completely different consideration. So um, in every single case, the costs are there. Then, of course, there's the cost of providing uh, precisely what it is that the U.S. government determines is necessary to put in place in order to make it work. But at the end of the day, uh, when we start looking at the benefits compared to even those all those costs put in, you're way ahead. Not specifically for pre-clearance. Um, the question, in case you didn't hear it, was do we have any numbers to go with that? I mean, I've never seen it. I don't know whether Joy has seen it. I don't know if we've ever done it that way. I mean, we've looked at the total cost of, uh, a, you know, the total cost of acquisition of a customer, say, for example, from the United States. But uh, that includes all of those kinds of costs. But in terms of breaking it out, um, I have never seen that done. And in any event, it would be peculiar to the Bahamas and even would be peculiar, for example, to Nassau compared to Grand Bahama compared to Paradise Island. It would be completely different. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is there a specific period attached to it, like for a number of years or? No, it's uh, in place since 1974 and continues on until uh, either party decides they want to end it. Yeah. Greg Phillip from Nevis. Just, I would like you to share your thoughts about the collection dissemination and use of tourism statistical data in the Caribbean? 
You don't want me to do that. <laughs> um, the, uh, first of all, I mean, tourism is an economic development tool. If you don't have data to support the, um, your beliefs and the things you're putting forward, then the person with the biggest title wins, as opposed to the person who is making the most sense. And so uh, I can tell you I'm very much involved in having created a tool that, as far as I'm concerned, is extraordinary. And I don't mind talking about it in some detail. I mean, it's been done in conjunction with some data scientists from KPMG in Germany that begins to take raw data and begins to provide information and what we call actionable insights like you've never seen before. Because the business of just listing data in terms of how many people came from which country is useless. When you begin to look at it in detail in terms of the behavioral side of things, and when you combine that data with information about what they did when they were in the destination, and also what they thought about what they did in the destination, you begin to see some things that are absolutely amazing. And then you also get some issues related, for example, in terms of what's the cost of acquisition of a certain kind of customer, um, and also rates of return, how many family members came with them. I can tell you that the, and I was saying uh, just earlier in part of the conversation, that the nonsense about I believe this is about to end, because you can now begin to talk to somebody and saying, I don't care what you believe, here are the facts and begin to address that in some great deal of detail. And the reason I spend some time talking about inducing the direct benefits of tourism is because when you add that and lay that information in regarding the value of tourism, all of a sudden you begin to see some things of how you should be spending your money and where that's completely contrary to what people have come to commonly believe. So uh, we have a long way to go, but I think we're accelerating the pace at which we're gonna get there. And I think you're gonna see a transformation coming in in our region pretty soon. You still have some perhaps left. Yes. I think everybody's interested in hearing more about that, statistics and... Well, I mean, it, it is, it, it, see, the thing is that one of the big advantages of the tool that we've been created, I mean, the thing is, which is shocking, is a tool that takes natural language and produces the information for you. So you can go into the tool and you can type in how many people came from Los Angeles, California to my destination in the period of time this and who came with this age group and did this and enjoyed that. You can literally type that in and up comes a graph that shows you that bit of information. The big problem with tourism statistics for a long time has been that you had somebody in the research department that you had to go and say, can you go and pull a report for me? Now somebody sitting at their desk can naturally inquire and get the information that they're looking for in terms of making their decision. Or, forgive me, you know, but, you know, and I used to be one, so I am now blaming myself. The minister gets up and makes statements about things that make no sense. It's nonsense. But somebody needs to begin to provide the minister with that information so that he doesn't go ahead and do that. Or to politely say to the minister, minister, that's not true. Here is the evidence of that not being true. Because, you know, it ain't so much the things you don't know that hurts you. It's the things you know that just ain't so. And that's been the problem for a long time in Caribbean tourism. The things that we know to be true is not true. And we continue to act on those things and spend money on those things. We don't get the return on investment of those things, but we are beginning to begin to fix that. And that's, that's I think, a very important part. That's my 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, one question here. Um, I want to go back to what you mentioned a little earlier in your presentation about the tax situation, airport fees, and so on. A lot of Caribbean islands, I think, struggle with the, uh, the situation where tourism economy is doing well, hotels are doing well, and so on, but the government is having a struggle balancing their budget. So first thing they look at is, of course, taxation. In your experience, what are some of the things that government can do better or to, to avoid that situation and still derive direct benefits from tourism? Well, I think, uh, see, now that's a very good question in light of what I was just talking about. If you are measuring tourism in government in terms of the tax collection from departure taxes and only from uh, hotel taxes, you are mismeasuring tourism. And so the benefits that you get 
from forgive me, but these are the large visible groups of people. It is the maids and waiters and the income that they get and when they go into the supermarket and spend that money, that is your tax too. So if you're running 60% occupancy, if you go to 90% occupancy, you have just added 50% to your tax collection in effect from so doing. So if you are doing something on the front end that diminishes the number of people coming to your destination, you're committing economic suicide without knowing it. So the whole idea is to make sure that you are doing those things that advance the number of people who are being employed. Because the biggest scourge in the Caribbean right now is employment. The genius of tourism is there's no such thing as, um, a, 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 as a, a jobless recovery. There's no such thing in tourism. The more people come, the more people get employed. The more people get employed, the more tax gets paid. So if you are diminishing the number of people coming, it's economic suicide. But I'm saying when you get the facts, you begin to understand that and begin to show the treasury that this makes a great deal of sense, then they begin to alter their thinking and, and the actions that they're taking. I'm all for maximizing the benefits to the treasury as well as the benefits to employment. I'm not in the business of trying to deprive government of, of taxes. I'm just saying what they're doing right now is self-defeating. The question was of establishing tourism satellite accounts. Is, is, is establishing a national uh, uh, um, table of accounts uh, within, the, uh, um, within the, the, the country. Let me just tell you how we got to where we are in terms of TSA in the Bahamas. The Ministry of Tourism paid the Department of Statistics to do it. If you sit and wait for the Department of Statistics to do it, it ain't going to happen. It ain't my budget. But if you think it's very important in tourism, you go pay for the Department of Statistics to do it. And the value you get from it is, 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 is incredible. But the biggest impediment is having a system and table of accounts and national accounts in order to get it done. Um, the question you didn't ask is, um, uh, I, uh, uh, he was present at the opening of NASA International Airport, the new pre-clearance facilities, and what are some of the benefits from New Providence as a result of those facilities? I think, uh, first of all, the benefits um, that accrue, accrue not just simply to New Providence, but also to the rest of the Bahamas. Uh, um, we are the definition of insanity in tourism in the region. Let me explain to you why. Uh, the Bahamas uh, um, is number three in the Western Hemisphere in per capita GDP for independent countries. The United States number one, Canada number two, Bahamas number three. Uh, tourism is the biggest part of our economy. Um, 80% of our tourism and 70% of our population lives on 2% of our land. So the opportunity for the development, so the, the, the principle of creating this airport is to service the other 98%, not just simply the 2%. And so you get people who want to come to the Bahamas and also go back home who fly from these islands. So Nassau is the hub that takes advantage of it. So the opportunity for developing tourism and forgive me, Joy, this is what Joy is going to talk about at our seminar uh, um, uh, um, tomorrow. It's the benefits really is, is, is the backhaul, is the 98% of these other islands that need to be and grow and, uh, and develop. So it's not just simply for New Providence. So that's an inv infrastructural investment in the future development of tourism. Um, but in terms of ease and facility, I, mean, I have personally heard somebody say, standing in line, the reason they come to the Bahamas is because how easy it's getting in and out. And not once, just simply hear people say it. So anecdotally and actually, there's no question it has enormous uh, uh, value. Sorry, as a follow-up to that question, to what extent does the establishment of a precurrent site uh, redirect demand from other Caribbean destinations to that destination based on the premise that the products are traditionally very much homogenous? Um, have you been able to identify if it has any such impact? Um, no, I don't, even, I don't think it's even been examined, but that's a very good question. Um, and that should spur anybody thinking about doing it to accelerate. By the way, Punta Cana is about to get there uh, also as one of the, as one of the destinations. That's a, that's a good question. I don't, I've never heard the, that about the potential diversion of business elsewhere to the Bahamas. I suspect that it will happen, and it does happen, but to whatever degree it does, I don't know, I've never seen, I've never seen it.
So when you ask how many it is, when you look at the beginning of it, there was a definite acceleration. I mean, it's been some time ago. Percentage-wise, I remember numbers of like 8% in growth. And see, there are a couple other things that I am not telling you about that's very important. Right, right. See, see, let me just tell you, when you're in the casino business, which was a core part of the tourism business in the Bahamas back then, and when I can fly in for the day and go into a casino for the day and pre-clear and fly out, that's my destination of choice. That has made an enormous difference. And in terms of, so the 8% that I remember seeing as a number included that and then another statistic which was incredible, which was Florida-Bahamas combination vacations. Florida is so close that a significant number of people would fly from South America, from Europe, and because they're so close to the Bahamas, and I don't know when I'm gonna get back here again, and when you are proposing to somebody, by the way, you don't have to worry about long lines getting back in the United States, you can pre-clear, I'm gone. So when you add up all of the bits and pieces, Sorry, Joy, I'm not supposed to tell all the secrets, but I can't help myself. Um, when you begin to add on all the bits and pieces in terms of the casino stuff, the impulse stuff, and that was part of the impulse uh, piece of it, and, and also the Florida Bahamas combination vacation people, that is a huge piece of business. Now, let me just tell you the other thing, where we decided in the Bahamas that we don't like shooting ourselves in the foot, we shoot ourselves in the head. Now, what used to happen is the reason the casino business was working so well is because the cost of that customer to come over was so low before we start adding a bunch of taxes to it that the casino would pay for them to come over because they knew that they'd make their money back with somebody gambling day. But when you raise the price, because you know, no, I can't make that anymore, so that business dries up. Then you get somebody on the Florida Bahamas combination vacation who said, wait, honey, we are so close to the Bahamas, it's $99 to get there, let's go. When you make it $249, well, I'm not so sure. So you do some things that you build, understand the consequences of it. So the 8% was an early number. I will bet you that over a period of time, that's probably been sustained until we began to add some of these impediments. The Caribbean is not the Caribbean. The Caribbean is, a, is about 30 territories. Now you hear these statistics, tourism statistics, Tourism in the Caribbean went up 24%. What does it mean to you? To me, it doesn't mean anything. For Bahamas, you would say, yeah, we, we probably have 20%. Dominican Republic probably says we have 28%. But a whole bunch of other territories, they have 10%, 2%, or whatever. I mean, it goes back to the business of, of, of headcount tourism. <clears throat> that if, it really makes any sense. And we say, and the reason that I am such an advocate for tourism satellite accounts and the analogy is that's the financial statements for the tourism sector. Uh, has anybody in this room ever seen um, the financial statement for a bank that shows how many people came through the doors of the bank in the last year? Has anybody ever seen that? Has anybody ever seen um, a supermarket company that do their financial statements and at the end of the year they show how many people came into the supermarket? Anybody ever seen that? I rest my case. So we continue to do things that supposed to be a surrogate for measuring tourism, and it isn't. Um, you know, there's a property in the Bahamas called the Ocean Club. Average room rate is probably $1,500 a night. Are we counting that person as the same value to my economy as the person who is coming and spending $50 for their room a night? Does this make any sense? And when you start looking, at what people are purchasing in terms of local products versus the products that are imported, and so your margin on it is complete. So when, so all of that comes out into your tourism satellite accounts. You begin to see exactly how valuable locally sourced products are. I am convinced that the impetus to provide a lot more locally sourced products would be much greater when we begin to recognize how valuable that is to our economy as opposed to this churn of importing stuff. And all of that begins to come out. So the headcount tourism is really mismeasuring tourism in a way that is absolutely extraordinary. Now, I have to tell you, you know, if you're the Minister of Tourism, you look for that number going up. That's how you measure tourism. 
that whichever number is going up, this month we had a 50% rise in stopover visitors. And then when the visitors go down the next month, this month we had a total increase in cruise passengers. So you tout whichever thing is the one moving in the right direction. It has nothing to do with the economy, but I think when we begin to do that, I mean, you have, for example, in the United States, the Congressional Budget Office, which nowadays is in the news more frequently than ever, where people measure the value of some proposal. And the more numbers you get, the greater your capacity to be able to do that. And that's something that I think is so very important in terms of making sure that we measure tourism in the right kind of way. I think you got one more question there. Yeah. Thank you, good afternoon. How often do you change the intricate variables uh, for your TSA? Because obviously, um, you know, um, and, and I guess you re can relate to what I'm asking because obviously the consumption and how, what is spent for local consumption versus direct and indirect uh, for tourism, um, those will change over, over time and how f frequent do you change them? There's a man who, by reason of his question, knows what he's talking about. Um, that's a very important point. You see, TSA is really a tool that's created by the um, World Tourism Organization. And so, because the intent of TSA ultimately was to make comparisons between countries. So you have some kind of consistency in terms of what is being done across the board. So you really change it to the degree that the standards that people are saying is the best way to measure these kinds of things are in fact changing. So you're using an international standard as opposed to a local standard so that when you are measuring your tourism gate somebody else on the TSA, the same thing with, you know, the, the, the um, what the FAT, what the financial people talk about, the standards for accounting, international standards for accounting. So it's the same kind of process where the international standards for accounting comes to bear on what you're doing so that when you're making comparisons, you know you're making comparisons that are very real. So we change them as often as it's being recommended by the people who are the governors of the TSA.